Welcome to our training module on electric motors. During the next few hours, we will acquaint you with the principles of operation, the basic construction, and the procedures followed in the disassembly, repair, and reassembly of a common electric motor. We want to emphasize the fact that we are concerned only with the mechanical repair of motors, not electrical. Electrical work is handled by experts in that field. Although you will not be concerned with electrical repairs in these motors, we feel that a basic introduction to motors and how they work will help you better understand the mechanical work you'll be responsible for. There are three basic classes of electric motors, alternating current induction motors, alternating current synchronous motors, and direct current motors. Each of these classes is broken down into a wide variety of types each with its own special characteristics. The motor we will concentrate on in this course is probably the most common type now in use. It uses alternating current, or AC, and is known as a three-phase induction motor. It generates about 15 horsepower. This is the motor we are talking about. It is simple, rugged in construction, and is a convenient size for demonstration purposes. More than 90% of the electric motors now used in industry are of this basic type. Once you learn the basic mechanical construction of this motor, you'll have little difficulty applying your knowledge toward most other motors. Motors of this type may be used to drive a variety of equipment, such as pumps, fans, blowers, and compressors. As you see, there is no limit to the number of motors which may be used, with six of them shown here on a row of pumps. This type of motor is generally considered to be one of the most efficient built. They may range in size from less than one horsepower, as shown here, to this giant 14 and one half thousand horsepower model. Note the size of the motor compared to the workman standing just to the left. There are other motors available which are more than three times as powerful as this one, with a horsepower rating of about 50,000. All of these motors have the same basic principles of operation. We'll show you what they are so you'll better understand the mechanical operation. To begin with, an electric motor is a machine which converts electrical energy into mechanical energy. The electrical energy is fed to the motor through a power cord, as you already know. The motor then introduces a very important middle step by changing the electrical energy into magnetic energy through the use of electromagnets. The electromagnets then work together to convert the incoming electrical energy into useful mechanical energy, which, as you know, is the turning of the shaft. The mechanical energy of the turning shaft is then transferred to the driven equipment through the drive shaft. Everyone is familiar with the electrical energy obtained by plugging a motor in, and everyone is familiar with the result, the drive shaft turning. Therefore, we'll spend a couple of minutes to show you how the motor uses the electricity to turn the shaft. We mentioned that there are two electromagnets in an electric motor. This is one of them which is attached to the shaft. It is called a rotor. This is the second magnet, called the stator. It is part of the motor housing, therefore it does not move. We'll use this assembly to illustrate what happens inside an electric motor when the two electromagnets are magnetized. We have taken a shaft and attached a magnet to the end of it then placed it on the wheels of a static balancer, which will serve as bearings. The shaft and magnet will represent the rotor. The workman is now holding a second magnet near our rotor magnet. We'll say that the magnet held in the workman's hand is the stator magnet. And we all know what happens when like ends of magnets are placed in close proximity, as shown here. The result is that the rotor magnet is pushed away, as shown. 
Since it is fastened to the shaft, the shaft turns, the same as it would in a motor. On the other hand, if the workman reverses the magnetic field by reversing his stator magnet, the result is that the rotor magnet is pulled toward it, as you can see. This is true because opposite ends attract each other. Needless to say, this is an extreme simplification of the principle of operation of an electric motor. In motors, the magnetic fields are generated through the use of electricity and electromagnets. Although the magnetic fields are considerably more complex, the result is the same. The magnets push or pull each other, turning the rotor and the drive shaft. Remember that there are two electromagnets in an electric motor. One is the rotor, which rotates, inside the stator, which is stationary. The stator is the second of the two magnets. The rotating magnetic fields created in the stator by electrical energy either repel or attract the rotor, causing it to turn. The end result is that the shaft turns. Now you have seen how an electric motor converts electricity to magnetic force and how the magnetic fields turn the shaft to create mechanical energy. Remember, however, that you will be concerned only with mechanical repairs. This explanation of the principles of operation of electric motors is only meant to give you a basic background and to satisfy your curiosity. Now that you have an idea of how an electric motor operates, Let's take a closer look at the parts which make up a motor. As we mentioned earlier, we will be working with this particular motor throughout the remainder of this course. This is the rotor of the motor we were just looking at. Actually, only the red part is the rotor. It is fastened securely to the shaft through any of several methods. It may be keyed on with an interference fit, welded on, or even clamped on. Many rotors will have fans built in to either or both ends, as you can see on this one. The blades help to circulate the air around the rotor and stator during operation of the motor, helping to keep them cool. This is the main motor housing, which includes the base and the stator, shown here in red. The stator is fastened securely in the housing and does not move during the operation of the motor. As we told you earlier in this segment, magnetic fields are generated between the surface of the rotor, shown here, and the inner surface of the stator. The interaction of these magnetic fields produce torque, or turning force, causing the rotor and the shaft to turn. Here's how the two look when assembled. As you can see, there is very little clearance between them. The clearance is generally referred to as the air gap of the motor. Now let's examine all of the parts of the motor after it has been disassembled, as shown here. The workman is pointing out the rotor and stator, which we just examined. You may have noticed this small box on the side of the housing during one of the earlier pictures. It is called the motor lead junction box. It contains the electrical leads, which must be connected to the power source. The junction box should be tightly sealed at all times to prevent condensation and corrosion that could lead to short circuits. Both ends of the motor housing are capped with these end bells, or bearing brackets, as they are sometimes called. We will refer to them as end bells throughout the remainder of this course. The end bells are bolted tightly to the housing, with the mating surfaces being pointed out here by the workman. These are the bearing cartridges. One of them slides over each end of the rotor shaft and is bolted in place in the end bell. Therefore, the cartridges and the bearings in them support the rotor during the operation of the motor. These are the bearings we're talking about. This particular motor is equipped with ball bearings, although other models may have roller or even sleeve bearings. 
The bearings fit into the bearing cartridges as being pointed out here. Once the bearings are installed in the cartridges, they are held securely in place with these bearing retainers, which are bolted to the cartridges. Here's another feature of the bearing cartridges with which you should be familiar. These are brass bushings. During normal operation, they will not come in contact with the shaft. However, if the ball bearings fail, these bushings will serve as auxiliary bearings to prevent excessive damage to the motor until you are able to turn it off. The two circular plates being pointed out here are known as end plates. They're installed on the end bells with the inner circle of cap screws in each plate screwed into the bearing retainer and the outer circle screwed into the end bell. In short, the end plates connect the bearing cartridge assemblies to the end bells and hold them in place. This ventilating fan is mounted on the shaft fit, which is being pointed out. The fan is outside the end bell and is meant to cool the motor during operation. After the fan has been installed on the end of the shaft outside the end bell, it is covered with the fan housing being pointed out. The parts shown across the top of the picture fit together as shown from left to right. The fan housing, the cooling fan, end bell, motor housing, and another end bell. The fan housing serves as a safety guard, and it sometimes encloses a filter to prevent the entry of dirt into the motor. That concludes a brief examination of the parts which make up this particular electric motor. Motors such as this one may be equipped with any of a variety of lubrication systems. The motor we're working with in this module is lubricated with grease, which is introduced through a fitting and forced through the bearings by the pressure from a grease gun. Other bearings may be lubricated with oil, as shown in this system which drips oil from an oiler. Another common system of lubrication is shown with these sleeve bearings. The oil rings, shown in yellow, pick the oil up from a sump and distribute it over the surface of the turning shaft. This is a somewhat more complicated setup called a flood lubrication system. Oil is supplied to the bearings through piping by an oil pump which creates a low pressure of 3 to 10 pounds. There is a wide variety of these systems in use. In any case, lubrication is a very important part of the operation of your electric motors. You should identify the type of system your motor utilizes and then make sure that the lubricant, whatever it is, is in good condition and at the required level. Another important consideration is the type of enclosure on your motor. It won't be often that you'll find an electric motor on an operating unit as it is shown here. The enclosure, or overall casing of the motor, comes in a wide variety of sizes and shapes. This is a drip-proof model. It's constructed to prevent the entry of any falling particles into the motor enclosure. This is a splash-proof model. It is designed so liquid drops or solid particles which fall on the unit or are splashed on it are prevented from entering. The enclosure will block water coming at it from any angle ranging from straight down to 10 degrees below horizontal. This motor is weather protected. It has side openings through which air travels up into the space above the stator. Rotor fans draw the air from this chamber through the motor windings. The heated air is then discharged through the outlet vents. This is what is called a pipe ventilated model. It is totally enclosed except for inlet and outlet air openings. Ducts are connected to the inlet to supply clean, dry air which is circulated through the motor and discharged through the vents. This is a very popular model, known simply as fan cooled. It is totally enclosed with a fan at the end of the motor shaft to circulate air around its totally enclosed motor frame. The final type we will show you is explosion proof. It is designed to withstand an internal explosion of a specific gas or vapor and to prevent any gas or vapor around the motor from igniting. 
That concludes our introductory segment to electric motors. We'll be back with the disassembly of our motor after you complete exercise number one in your workbook.